Hi, this is Jeff Spence, your Math 135 instructor for the Community College of Denver, and this is our video lecture over 6.2, which covers the binomial probability distribution. So in 6.1, we, uh, we introduced the discrete probability distributions, and just the main thing was that the, that the sum of the probabilities had to equal 1, and each probability had to be between 0 and 1. Um, and there's all different types of discrete probability distributions, but there's a very special one called the binomial probability distribution. So bi is a Latin prefix for two, and that's going to be a big thing here. We're going to look at experiments with two outcomes. So we're going to determine whether our experiment is binomial or not, and then we're going to compute probabilities from that binomial experiment, and then compute the mean and the standard deviation of that binomial random variable. So uh, this is a big thing here that um, we have to remember in order for an experiment to be binomial. It'll be fairly obvious uh, that an experiment will be binomial, but let's just go over this. Um, I know that the, the I'm not going to talk about these in order. The big thing um, for a binomial experiment, the, the most obvious thing is number three. For each trial, there are two mutually exclusive or disjoint outcomes, and we call those success or failure. All right, so it's either either you get this result or you don't. Success doesn't always mean a good thing. Uh, sometimes if you're looking at, in a community, whether people have a certain disease or not, um, if you're interested in counting the number of uh, people that have the disease, then the disease is the success, even though it's not a good thing. So this is just a labeling, meaning that there's two outcomes. That's why we say binomial, two outcomes. Um, and then for, so for each trial, there are two outcomes. Well, the other key thing is that we perform the experiment a fixed number of times. Um, so we can say that we sampled 20 people and um, the, the fixed number of times is 20. Or if we looked at 10 different buses and saw if they were late or not, then that's a fixed number. And we call each one of those a trial. And in each trial, there's a success or a failure. The second thing is that the trials have to be independent of each other. Uh, this means the outcome of one trial will not affect the outcome of the, the, the subsequent trials. And then the probability of success is fixed for each trial of the experiment. So um, we're at the beginning of, of the, or the introduction of the problem will be given this probability of success. And um, that will be fixed for, the, for each trial. So we have notation for this. The number of trials we denote with n. Okay, We've seen n before. It's like the sample size. This time it just represents the number of trials that we have run for the experiment. So it could be, you know, 10, 20, 15, it just depends on the problem. P, lowercase p, will denote the probability of success. So that's going to be a big thing there. We're going to convert p to a decimal. Usually we get this percent, uh, or get this as a percent in the problem, and we just convert that to a decimal. So if p is the probability of success, then 1 minus p is the probability of failure, because they're disjoint, they're uh, complements. And then x is the variable, the random variable, um, uh, counting the number of successes that we get from in, in, in independent trials. If you remember from the book, we talked about that one where we sampled 20 people and recorded whether or not they had type A blood. Um, and x represented the number of people that had, had type A blood. So remember we did uh, x is from 0 to 20, uh, one, two, 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 20. So x represents the number of successes, and it can go for anywhere from zero. You can have zero successes up to the number of trials that you uh, run the experiment. So knowing this notation is going to be big for us, n, p, and x. Okay, so let's just look at a few experiments and determine whether they're binomial or not. Um, it says a player rolls a, a pair of fair die ten times. The number, of, uh, the number x of sevens is rolled and recorded. Or sorry, the number of sevens rolled is recorded. So um, first thing, we have a fixed number of trials. Um, second thing, the probability of success getting a seven for each each roll is the same um, because the die are fair and um, there's a certain probability of rolling a seven and that doesn't change. Uh, the, the other thing we need to check, let me go back. Okay, so the trials are independent. We have a fixed number of trials. And then for each trial, there are two mutually exclusive outcomes. So when they say they record the number of sevens, so the way we look at this is we're either going to get a seven or we're not going to get a seven. So if they're recording the number of sevens, we say that's binomial. It's two outcomes. And then the last one 
is uh, the probability of success is fixed for each trial. So we're rolling die. The rolling die is independent of the next roll, and the probability of getting a 7 is the same each time. So this is definitely a binomial experiment. Um, next one, the 11 largest airlines on a, had an on-time percentage of 84.7%. That would look like a probability of success there. Um, in order to assess reasons for delays, an official with the FAA, FAA randomly selects flights until she finds that 10 were not on time. The number of flights X that need to be selected is recorded. This almost sounds like a binomial, but it's not because she's randomly selecting flights until she finds 10 that were not on time. So sometimes she could, um, she could select 20 flights, sometimes she could select 10, sometimes it could take 100 flights. So she's not running a fixed number of trials. So that first, that first uh, uh, requirement, she's not running a fixed number of trials. Like in this first one, we're rolling a, die fair, a, t a fair die 10 times, and that's it, pair of die 10 times. So we have a fixed number of trials. Here we do not. So even though we have a probability of success, and even though we have two outcomes, on time or not, we, and the probability that each flight is on time or not is going to be independent of each other, it's not a binomial. And then this one, it says, in the class of 30 students, 55% are female. The instructor randomly selects four students. The number of female students is selected and recorded. This is very close to being binomial, but it's not. So we have a fixed number of trials. We're selecting four students. Um, but... The problem is, we have a fixed number of trials. The trials are not independent. When we sample from a small group, like 30 people, and we want to know the probability of getting a, a female, well, if we randomly select one student, then after that, the probability of getting a female changes because now we're selecting from 29 students and not 30. So this is saying the trials are not independent of each other. This is very close. But if this would have to be if we're selecting from the world population or a very, very large population, and we wanted to know the number of females that we get from a random sample of four. Okay, so next, let's just compute the probabilities of a binomial experiment. Um, I'm going to show, we're, the big thing is we have this formula. The probability of obtaining X successes in N independent trials of a binomial experiment. So this is the probability of X successes is NCX, which is the number of ways that you can get um, those x successes out of n times the probability of success to the x power times 1 minus the probability of success which is the probability of failure to the n minus x and this works for x anywhere from 0 to n I know this formula look, probably looks a, a little confusing or maybe intimidating to some of you um, I'm going to show how it works in my other video but I'll also show you in that other video that we can use a function in our calculator called the binome PDF to do this formula for us. Um, so the next video will really show you how this formula works and how to use that binome PDF. But this is the base, This is the formula that's used or that the calculator used. And uh, we're just going to compute one binomial probability really quick. So it says, um, according to Experiment Automotive, 35% of all car owning households have three or more cars. In a random sample of 20 car owning households, what is the probability that exactly five have three or more cars? So we have a fixed number of trials. We're sampling 20 houses. 35% are car owning households. So that's the probability, or sorry, 35% have three or more cars. So that's the probability of success. And we want to know the probability of getting exactly five out of 20. Um, we're going to assume independence and that the, the probability of success of getting three or more cars is 35% for each one. So this is a binomial. And it just says, okay, we're trying to find the probability of a number 5 having 3 or more cars. So the probability of 5 is 20, choose 5, times the probability of success, 0.35, to the 5th power, times 1 minus 0.35, which is 0.65, to the 20 minus 5. Now, they didn't show the steps, but the probability of getting exactly 5 that have 3 or more cars is 12.72%. And I'll show you in my next video really how this formula works step by step. Um, but let's just cover the mean and standard deviation of a binomial random variable, and then we'll be done with this uh, video. So here are two formulas. These two formulas are in your formula sheet. It says the mean of a, a binomial uh, variable is just the number of trials times the probability of success, and the standard deviation is the square root of the number of trials times the probability of su su success, excuse me, times 1 minus the probability of success. 
So both of these formulas are in your formula sheet. We'll just do a quick example. This one says 35% of car, the same thing, it's the 35% of car owning households have three or more cars. Let's say now that we sample 400 car owning households, let's figure out the mean. So mean, remember, is expected value. If we sampled 400 car owning households, how many households would we expect to have three, more, three or more cars? Well, that makes sense. We would just take the 400 times 0.35. We would expect 140 households to have three or more cars. If we do the standard deviation, just following the formula here, we get 9.5 far. And this is just a, another basic thing where if we wanted to do z-scores or look at the bell curve, now we have the mean and the standard deviation. So the, these formulas, let me remind you, are in your formula sheet. But the big thing is, is that I want you to, to lead on to the next video where I'm going to do um, break it down, this formula, how it works, and then show you how to, to find these probabilities using the binomial PDF. So check that next video. And just remember the big part of this video is having the formula for the mean and the standard deviation and understanding really what a binomial experiment is based on these four requirements and then understanding the main terminology that we're going to use, which I'll introduce in the next video as well. See you next time.